Hi everyone, uh, I am here with Corey as always. Say hi Corey. Hey, how's it going? And uh, this video is probably going to become part of a uh, short series because this uh, topic is deceptively more complicated than it would seem. The topic is what is pixel art? And this is something I've wanted to cover for a long time. I've been a pixel artist for decades and I belong to several pixel artist forums and uh, Facebook groups and stuff like that. And so over the years I've seen so many aspiring new pixel artists coming into things and, and wanting to learn how to do pixel art and coming up against a lot of issues wondering why their stuff doesn't look as sort of legitimately pixel art as they want it to and sort of struggling with certain stylistic choices because they don't know certain things about where pixel art sort of why pixel art is what it is it's very interesting because it is one of very few art forms aside from very classical art forms like uh, fresco painting it's one of the art forms that evolved completely around like every reason it looks the way it looks is is working around severe graphical limitations and right. that that is a quintessential element of why pixel art is and looks like pixel art and the problem a lot of uh, people getting into pixel art now is the technology they're using and the graphics program they're using a lot of the times they have they not only do they not have these limitations but they don't tell you about these limitations and a lot of these programs might not even let you even remotely easily simulate these limitations and so obviously as an as an obvious example you've got pixel art the whole one of the massive reasons that pixel art is pixel art is because the pixels are big you can see the pixels otherwise it's just digital graphics if you if the resolution is so high that you can't see individual pixels with the naked eye it's just no longer it no longer has any of the aesthetic that people associate with pixel art but what a lot of people don't understand as intuitively as along with that the resolution limitations another massive aspect that all original pixel art had was that it was severely limited in how many colors could be used in any given place on the screen or on the screen overall or in a given object like a character sprite or a background tile and then even out of like let's say in the 8-bit era you might only have 16 or 24 colors total to use on your whole screen counting the background and the characters and effects and everything but then even those few colors you have to use for everything come out of a very small total number of colors you can use in general. So imagine you had one of those Crayola crayon boxes of like, let's say 64 colors, and then you had to pick 24 of those colors that you can use to make your whole image. And there's no blending and there's no pressing lighter or harder to get shades. You have to use the exact color of the crayon itself. So those are the kind of color limitations and like I said, that was for the 8-bit pixel art. And obviously things got less limited, but still very limited compared to modern graphics. So that's another reason so many, I've seen so many beginner pixel artists using programs like Photoshop and they're uh, they're wrestling, they're wondering why their stuff doesn't look right, and they're often using far too many colors that are way too close together, gradations that are far too smooth in some places, but then they want that pixel art aesthetic, so then they use dithering in other places, which makes no sense to use if you can use as many colors as you want to, which they're doing everywhere else. So it creates a strange conflict within the image itself. And just for anyone that uh, is not familiar yet with the word, dithering is that checkerboard pattern. I'm sure I can find an example in an image here. There we go. So this Altered Beast is an actual pixel-perfect screen grab from the Sega Mega Drive, or Genesis as it's known in America. And you can see that they did not have enough colors to go around, at least based on how they set up their color palette to get a smoother gradient and but they wanted this gradient from dark to light so they used a very basic form of this it's the equivalent of cross hatching in ink drawing where you're right. using a light and a dark and you're putting them right near each other with this pattern the most 
common known dithering pattern is this checkerboard pattern. And at a distance, you'll see when it's completely zoomed out at modern, very tiny pixels, you can't even tell that that's made out of a bunch of dots near each other. It looks like an actual gradation of more colors than are actually there. So it looks like it's one, two, three, four, five blue colors when it's tiny pixels, but you can see in reality it's one, two, three blue colors to make the, the sky. So one interesting thing about this is we're talking about the aesthetic and trying to achieve the aesthetic. That's an important thing that modern pixel artists need to keep in mind, is that not only was pixel art, did it completely revolve around the graphical limitations of the day. That's what made it pixel art. But also another massive aspect of what affected how artists were going to handle things and work around these color limitations was actually the fact that every monitor and TV screen back then was CRT technology, which was inherently very blurry. So here's right. the same altered beast screen from the Mega Drive as it looks when you zoom in on a modern LCD screen where every pixel, every color is perfectly crisp. Whereas if I undo here back to something I did previously, I enlarged it to four times the size but kept it pixel perfect and then I put a Gaussian blur filter over it. Mm -hmm. And what that did is it roughly simulated how blurry this would have looked on an actual TV screen. In a way, it could have looked even blurrier. And that was like even right. the high With quality scan monitors. Lines. Exactly. Scan lines and everything. Scan it's gonna... lines too. Yep. And so you can see that it's much harder to, to see where the dithering is compared to it. Let me undo and redo. And especially where the colors are already closer together, you get a little bit of texture from the dither, but it's much more pleasant. And right. uh, in the sky, especially up here, it is on a lot of TVs, it would have been impossible to tell that it was, especially if it wasn't a really large screen TV, it would have been nearly impossible to tell that it wasn't actually its own unique color to make that range smoother. So the point is, all modern artists now, or virtually all of them that are doing pixel art, are doing it based on this new reality of pixels on almost everyone's monitor being extremely crisp and distinct with none of that blurring. So the point is that the pixel artists back in the day that made all the graphics that modern pixel artists might want to copy, they would have been making very different decisions if they were working on LCD in four systems that were going to be displaying on perfectly crisp displays. Right. So the other interesting thing about dithering is the whole point of dithering was it was a effective way because of the blurriness back then to compensate for low colors, to create the illusion of more colors. And this was especially true because there was no such thing back then in general as like real time on the fly image decompressing. So dithering is horrendously bad in general for image compression because you no longer have a long row or, or group or box of pixels that are all the same color. So that dither pattern makes that particular, even if it's just a tile, now it's going to compress poorly compared to how it could have compressed. But that's not a concern they had. They had severe memory limitations and severe color limitations, but there was no penalty to dithering. Whereas right. once you have real-time, like modern systems, they can compress and decompress on the fly in a lot of different formats. So the dithering, not only does it no longer look as good, it's, it's no longer as easy to get away with on modern displays, but also it would have made the compression far less effective. So all of the benefits of the di of dithering are virtually gone unless you very specifically want that look. But keep in mind, even if you want that look, you're not actually simulating or emulating the look that the uh, original pixel art that you're copying had because that would have only been displayed on very blurry displays. Yeah, and that isn't to say that it should be avoided at all costs, right. because if you are going to do it on a modern display, you have to keep certain things in mind. Uh, like when it, What's clear here, just by looking at this image, when you look right. at that bottom band of that uh, sky there, oh, which is yeah. that the harshest of it all, because it's got two yeah. very contrasting colors, right. that 
it looks rough. It has a rough texture to it, which right. is probably not what they wanted for that sky. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, so the idea is you now you have to consider that it has a texture quality to it. It's going mm-hmm. to look rough. Now, there are elements of the screen that use similar dithery techniques that aren't as bad. For example, right. the stone wall on the very right side over there yep. on the screen yep, yep. is, is a, a good example because the the um, the values are not too contrasting with each other. Right. And it does give you the feeling of rough stone. So I Right. The texture that. is a benefit, not a uh, Right, right. Yeah. Uh, not a and penalty, it's not as so it's not as bad in the dirt down there, right. although it's still pretty uh, sort of a perfect pattern. So it looks a right. little, you know, looks a little too clean. But um, exactly, or too much like a rough checkerboard or a harsh checkerboard right. instead right. of a more organic, uh, speckly earth texture. Uh, to me, it wor- for me it works a lot better here in the far background because the mm-hmm. greens are fairly far apart and they're limited in a specific band. So it gives it. A smooth enough gradient and just enough texture so that it looks like there's wildernessy sort of stuff going back there, but it's in the distance and it's blurry. I think that worked well. Like you said, the bottom band on the sky was just, in my opinion, a kind of a bad decision. Right. Agreed. It worked yeah. a lot better up at the top of the sky. And yeah, if, yep. it, you know, with with modern displays in mind, if you have right. if you're going to work within these limitations and have a limited palette for your sky. Right. There are shapes you can make, different exactly. ways you can create that sky to where it doesn't look so um, right. Just like a this this, you yeah. know. So I wanted uh, to really quickly thing that they've created. Here. Yeah, I wanted to really quickly, and that, that's actually something I did want to mention really quickly is uh, something called channel bit depth or color bit depth. So right. if you look here in uh, good old ProMotion, uh, my go-to pixel art program, uh, modified channel bit depth. So the really old 8-bit systems, they had a very specific pre-made range of colors that you could pick from. In the case of the 8-bit Nintendo, it didn't even seem scientific. It was just, you know, it wasn't like really mathematically divided. It was just like, here's like 50-something colors that you can choose from. I'm sure there was some rhyme or reason to it, but I don't know what that was. But from the 16-bit era on, for sure, there's a bit channel for, for red, green, and blue. And it's the number setting of each of those color values that mix together to create any color you can display. So the 24-bit full range that we're used to, that uses 8-bit uh, channel. And the uh, so 8 times 3 is 24, hence 24-bit graphical color depth or graphics. But for the Mega Drive, it would be, I think it's 3. Is that correct? Do you remember? I believe so, yeah. Three so per. three bits, right? So three bits per channel, and then so now the reason I wanted to do that is I'm going to find this color, and I'm going to copy it here, and then we're going to do the same thing with the lighter color, and let's see what kind of other blues were available between that. So there was only one color possible that they could have displayed if they had it free in their color indices. So that's probably the issue was going on. They used all of the colors available for other things they considered more important in their different palettes. So when it came time to do the sky, they didn't have enough. So, So in other words, the Mega Drive could have displayed this color and then they could have dithered in between uh, let's see i mean even to. if they because i'm not sure they're using those blues anywhere else in the scene yeah. uh the, those top sky colors yeah. if they're not i mean they could have just chosen colors that were a little closer together right, and not exactly. so you know it would have been a little right. nicer but but right. perhaps you know this was a case of where they were Again, as we talked about in a previous video, maybe they were trying to mimic the actual arcade look or color right. scheme. You know, so I've seen kind of, yeah, I've seen know. the arcade version, and it had a higher color depth, and its gradation was definitely smoother. Right. So this is definitely this is certainly a matter of the the graphics team that was doing the porting down. They didn't give the sky a high priority and just mm-hmm. made a judgment call. And again, remember, they were working on a, um, 
for blurry TV screens, so it was far less relevant right. than, uh, than it is now when you see everything super sharp like this. But as Corey was mentioning, the other option would have been to alter, now that I have the channel bit depth set properly, any color I make will be a legitimate color that the master system can display so we could see if we can come up yes, with a that is much nicer yeah there we go so yeah, this things like that yeah this already looks better and more evenly distributed and smoother on even the crisp uh screen so if i did the same thing and brought it in photoshop and blurred it that would be uh much nicer and cl probably closer to what the arcade system looked like but i just wanted to show everyone that um that right. this is that the Mega Drive was capable of displaying a smoother range of blues. So it wasn't just that it was not capable at all of displaying a smoother range of blues. It's that they had used up that. That's a really important thing. Color indexes or indices. There's a super important aspect to pixel art was to go into the 8 bit days. So here is a great example, Shatterhand, a fantastic uh, later Beautiful generation 8-bit Nintendo game. Just amazing uh, graphic. Uh, the, the graphics team was fantastic. The programmers worked well with the, the artists to make a lot of parallax scrolling, slicing up the screen to get a very nearly 16-bit looking game out of the 8-bit Nintendo. Just fantastically done. But this is actually the all the colors that the 8-bit Nintendo was capable of displaying right here. And then what's more important to keep in mind, I think I have, that's a stuff we'll talk about later, here it is. So this is an example Corey made before of, and there's that same palette for the 8-bit Nintendo. And this is a beautifully and very carefully constructed mock-up of a game that could be done on the 8-bit Nintendo within its graphical limitations. So the important thing to know is that for the entire background, you have to pick your colors from here, and you only have four three-color palettes that you can use. So that's what this top row of 16 color indices is, and you'll notice black is in all of them. So that's one of the limitations of the 8-bit Nintendo. The first color index of each of these four background four-color palettes has to be the same color, and they just call that the background color needs to be the same in all four tile palettes. And to make matters more limiting, each 16 by 16 pixel area of the screen in a grid, 16 by 16 pixels, had to use only one of those palettes. Right. And so tiles were 8 by 8 pixels, but if you wanted to use a tile in an area where you already used a tile that was using one of those three color plus the background color, palettes, then that tile also would be forced to use that same palette. So you can imagine the artist had to be incredibly careful designing their palettes and designing their graphics and tiles to work within these color limitations. But luckily, a really good artist like uh, Corey uh, shows here, if you do that carefully, your graphics can look surprisingly colorful but at the same time, not too high contrast. And you can see Corey beautifully made large areas of monochromatic regions. You have these, these gray regions, these turquoise regions, and then the, the sky blue and the skyline. All of these areas of largely monochromatic space create a beautiful low contrast background for the character sprites and important elements to show up. And you'll see he carefully used the brightest, sharpest contrast, the grays, to very clearly represent the solid platforming elements of the level design. So this is a just beautifully done example. And it goes to show you how a massive part of pixel art, it's not just about working low res. It's not just about knowing that you shouldn't use 24-bit airbrushing style brushes in Photoshop. It's, it's not just the fact that you can see the pixels, it's being extremely mindful of how many colors you're using and how and where you're using them. The further away you get from that information, the, the less you follow those rules, the, the less uh, authentic your pixel art is going to look. Exactly. 
I just talked about the background graphical limitations of the NES, so now to quickly mention the sprite limitations. All of the moving characters, effects, shots, explosions, they all pretty much had to be done, with limited exceptions, by the sprites, which were even more limited in many ways than the background graphics. You had also, so the 16 colors after the top row of 16, which is for the background, this row here is for the sprites, and again, you only have three unique colors for each sprite, but to make matters worse, that color that is considered the background color in the tile palettes, it's transparent, so you can't use it at all for your graphics. It's just the empty space around your character or explosion. So, and you only had four of those palettes, so you had to be really careful with your, not only the design of each character sprite or effect, to make sure it was only using those three colors available for that particular sprite, or you had to make a very expensive choice with the number of sprites you can display and slap on like they did with uh, Mega Man, right, Corey? They used an extra sprite yep. for the face to give it some extra color. Mm -hmm. um, Similar so, to what yep. we're doing here with uh, exactly. the red hair on the guy there. Right, so you'll see his whole body is made with the same three colors. And then up at the top of the head, you've got this extra color that uses this different color palette. Uh, right here for the head and face, and then this is the palette for the body. So keep that in mind if you want to emulate 8-bit looking pixel art, and you want to learn how to do that, it's really good to do a little research and to understand those specific limitations that the actual pixel artists back in the day were working with, and automatically you'll, by working within those limitations, uh, you'll get a very authentic look to your work. Um, and then, so let's move up to 16-bit and give credit where it's due. I got this sprite rip from a quick Google search, but this was put together by somebody. I'll just show their little credit disclaimer from the big screen. There you go. So credit where it's due. Thank you for sprite ripping this, whoever you are. And so you can look at this really nice, colorful character. But, so I'm just going to isolate, and you can see all these colors here, it's a full 256, but if I actually choose any one of these frames, and make sure I crop out any other extra colors that were not part of the character, so there we go, we've just got the background color and the colors in the sprite itself, hold on a second, yeah, that's good, and so now I'm going to choose colors, remove unused colors, and compact and you'll see it fits perfectly in the top row and that is because on almost all 16-bit systems in some very powerful graphically powerful 8-bit systems like the Sega Master System and the TurboGrafx-16 which depending on who you ask is either 8-bit or 16-bit you had 16 color sprites which obviously, right. is a, obviously is a massive improvement over three color sprites and in many cases like with the Mega Drive you had several 16 color palettes that each any one sprite could use one of those 16 color palettes so you had a lot more graphical power to play with on 16-bit systems but if you want to do a 16-bit style character sprite art or animation then it'll really help you to work within these color limitations and that's something that really I think a lot of beginner pixel artists these days, they don't understand. A huge part of almost every pixel artist's workflow, doing really legitimate pixel art, especially back in the day, simultaneous to designing the character, the size, the proportions, the hairstyle, all of those things, and actually drawing out the sprite, a critical part of the, the art process that happened alongside all of those art decisions was the careful design and organization of the palette. So you have 15 color indices to use for the actual graphics, and then you have that background color, which is going to end up transparent so that you can see the background art behind the, the sprite character. So right. just as an example here, so we, we've reduced it down, but the palette the character would be working on, would it would have these colors, but he or she would have arranged it in a different way. So I'm just going to really quickly uh, start moving things around here. So the background color would almost always be the first color index for, for a technical reason. 
Also, it just it makes things nice and organized for the artist. But then they would divide it into very specific ranges. So let's just say we're going to go from white as the first color. Like you would have your your range of skin tones, your range of colors right. for the clothing, for the hair, and all of those things. And that way, your your the artist is carefully controlling how many colors do I really need to use for each thing to make sure that you have enough color ranges overall for the rest of the thing. So you could see a really interesting choice that I think was very effective, which was the black. So mm -hmm. what's interesting is a very common art style in the 8-bit days was to have black in all of your sprites and use it as an outline color. But this this is a more modern 16-bit style. I think it's called Cell Out. Where do you remember? Or do I have that right? Um, uh, but basically, sure. the, the idea is instead of having a black outline around your whole drawing, like it was drawn with ink, uh, black ink, like comic book art, and then colored in. I've got some kind of mode turned on. There we go. Um, yeah, I didn't know there was an official name for the style. Yeah, I, I think I I've know. read that before, but I don't remember for sure. But so anyway, so. The earliest 16-bit style, and especially the 8-bit style, you'd almost always see these pure black outlines around everything. And then later on, once they got more comfortable with all the colors they have to work with, they realized that they don't need that really stark black outline around everything. So you can see what they started doing is, there is mostly an outline around things, but it's just made with a slightly darker version of the color that it's surrounding. So the skin tones have the darker skin tone to create the uh, delineation and separation of the toes and things like that. And then uh, the gi has the darker red and the hair is sort of anti-alias into a very subtle sense of an outline with the darker gold colors. But you'll notice the black is used for the black belt of the character and very small areas where there's that uh, strap and then the inexplicable pitch black <laughs> eyebrows that Ken always right. had. Hmm. I wonder what uh, kind of bleach he uses uh, for <laughs> his hair. But anyway, so the point is, that I thought that was a really nice... A lot of artists would have been very tempted, and I certainly wouldn't be surprised if early on in the graphic design of this character, there very well could have been some color... Yeah, what's going on? Oh, I'm, that's why I'm still in this mode here. Okay. But so the artist very well may have, when he started designing the sprite, may have wanted a little highlight color or something in there. But it turned out to be unnecessary and a much, you get much better mileage out of smoothing out the gradients in the more important things that cover more of the character. And with something that's pitch black, it's sort of the perfect crime. If, if it's a fabric that's not reflective, you really don't need to waste color indices on sort of adding light and shadow into it. It's just, it's just the shape of it that's more important and it's moving. But yeah, and it doesn't, it's also very small. It doesn't take up much space. Exactly. Like if, if the black were actually like his pants or something, exactly. you would definitely want those shapes in there to, to show uh, the lighting on his legs and right. stuff, but but yeah, since it's just that belt in that small area, it's like you're right; it's a totally perfect decision. So, right. all right, we are back from a very short break, and during that break, I finished arranging this palette so you can see how a pixel artist in the day or doing very authentic pixel art to match 16-bit or 8-bit pixel graphics they would um, carefully arrange and design their colors as they design the art and it would look something like this and one of the other important elements of this was it wasn't just to make it easier for the artist to work to make a pretty final character one thing that they really had to keep in mind was what color indexes they're using where and the best example i can give is you might look at this palette and think, oh, it's kind of wasteful. There's two colors, actually three colors, that are all extremely close to one another. You've got the lightest color that's used in the hair, and then you've got this very, very light skin color, and then you've got this pure white color that's only used in a few very small places, like the whites of the eyes. 
and so you might ask yourself wow like you might think that's really wasteful i could consolidate at least two of those colors and then i'd have two more colors to maybe add the lighting to the belt or maybe i could add some cool who knows you know some maybe you really think there should have been some lime green fancy design <laughs> pattern on his pants right so you're like oh i'd have, I'd have two whole colors to work with that if i consolidated some of these colors that seem wasteful but the point is the reason that those colors are separate is one of the way you would get more mileage out of your graphics back then because memory limitations was also a massive element to why pixel art and especially pixel animation looked the way it did is that they would have alternate palettes for alternate characters so Ryu and Ken were the same exact sprite data, even in the game. The difference was, even in the, the, the game's RAM while it was running, all they needed to do bet between Ken and Ryu was have, in general, graphically speaking, was have the different hair as a sort of sprite uh, thing that you can change out, and then a different palette for the entire character sprite. So you can see now that I have this carefully arranged, I could just very quickly go into uh, this color setting thing and just grab this entire range. We'll go to about here, and then we can just kill that satur saturation, and suddenly we're halfway to Ryu. And then you would tweak right. the uh, the color tones because this is based. This is uh, like an arcade or Super Nintendo style color range. And then obviously you give him black hair or dark brown hair, and you know that's that's Ryu's body now. So uh, that that's a really or uh, as Corey pointed out to me earlier. Also, in a lot of games like this, you'd be able to use a different button while selecting your character to choose your character with a different color scheme, and that's how it worked. There was only the one set of character graphics. Uh, in the cartridge or CD or whatever, but then it would have these alternate palettes, these color schemes that are simply changing what the color value is in those indices. And if you change the color in those indices, you instantaneously change the appearance of the character. So that's the most of it for the color thing, but I did want to get back into the discussion on dithering a little bit more because Corey gave us such a nice example of more modern dithering methods and how they would be used and how the standard checkerboard pattern would almost never be used these days by an artist that unless they were really going for that super specific aesthetic there's almost never a good reason to use that very specific and very recognizable pattern because remember you're not just getting an illusion of a gradient with dithering you're getting texture so now with super sharp displays, the texture is the much more relevant aspect to dithering than the illusion of getting extra color, because unless your colors are already really close together, that's way less impactful than just the fact that you're adding some texture. So the point is, you can see here in the character's skin, on his face where it's smaller, there's this really nice subtle sort of zigzag back and forth pattern that gives you that little bit of extra gradation and a little bit of texture. And then when there's more room to do a gradation over a larger area, he goes into a more full dither, but you can see it's a more organic spaced out dither, which he knew he was going to get texture. So he dithered in a way that gave him a very specific kind of gross pickle skin kind of texture, a kind of puckered marked skin texture. And then for metallic objects, you can see this beautiful use of what you could call a linear dither, which is where, especially for shiny metallic objects, a gun barrel or cannon barrel or metallic column or cylinder, what you're going to do instead, of, here's a perfect example of it right here, which if there were more room, it could have been necessary, but this is overkill. This is why Corey did not do it. What you're doing is if you have this fairly large area you just you go to the darker color and then back to the slightly lighter color and then finally back to a larger area of the darker color 
And again, he could have done it here too, but it's not necessary. Go ahead, Corey. You yeah, want to I, say something? I was about to say, like, I can admit that uh, there are probably some ways to to tweak this image a little bit. Oh, maybe. sure. No, yeah. uh, I wouldn't have considered it a totally complete piece of art because right. uh, it was still a bit of a work, work in, progress, in progress. But I had right. got it pretty close right. to how I wanted it to look. So, yep. yeah. Yeah, no, it's, just, it's a great claim, example. So, know. yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> but, yeah, so this is these are the different ways that you can use. We'll, we'll call that a linear dither. And then one of the most common ones is just an organic instead of ordered dither. There's ordered dithering, which is going to be very mathematical. It's going to start with the perfect checkerboard pattern. And then, you know, for example, I'll just quickly draw it in. So you've got the full-on checkerboard pattern and then you're going to have it'll just space it out a little more so there's less and it'll just so you'll get the very exact very sort of mathematical and symmetrical pattern and then most of the time these days if you are going to use dithering at all if it's a metallic object you're going to want linear dithering and you're going to want to play with different styles of organic dithering either linear or not uh, so I, I really like the fact that how, how you did this floor back here. So it has some texture, but it's different from all the other surfaces. It's not as perfectly smooth as it mm -hmm. would be if you did the uh, linear dither style. But it's sort of like a hybrid between linear and, uh, you know, like a uh, like an organic one that you would use for dirt or this kind of pickly skin. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, it's just it's a really good thing to keep in mind. Another option is to not dither at all. If you if you're going to ha if you're doing this, this is especially common in skies. Another way to deal with this, which the technical constraint is, you would have been using more tiles. But the other option is to just create a cloud silhouette style shape, so that now you don't feel like you need that um, so smooth a gradation anymore, because you have this natural boundary. So right. to speak, and, and that will work even better if they had made that palette a little more carefully within the uh, color range that the Mega Drive was capable of. Mm -hmm. Say, so, like that's more like what I would have done, just gone with a uh, more organic shape. And if I was back in the day working on a CRT monitor, I would have combined the two, and then you'd get a really nice subtle look to your sky mm -hmm. with a little more detail. But anyway, so that's it for dithering. Yeah, and here with Shatterhand, you know, that's what they were doing here in the sky. Now, this one is designed to look more like a smoky sky, you know, because yeah. uh, of the, the particular environment. But you can see it's not mathematical dithering. They carefully did this. It looks a bit rough, but at the same time, it gives you the feeling of... Uh, kind of a polluted uh, uh, industrial sky. Right, right. And, uh, yeah. you know... You can do many things like that to yeah. pull off that gradient with, without it just looking like a smooth, you know. Like if a rough uh, checkerboard pattern or right, just the a best, stack of uh, gradients. Yeah. Right. I would say, like, if you love smooth gradients, it, it would, like, if you're going to be doing, working within these limitations, you really want to try to get that out of your system to an extent. Right. Uh, you have to, you have to find these clever ways of, blending between values dithering though in and of itself is like see they did a little bit even down there in the foreground on that sort of yellowish pillar piece whatever right. that is but it's it's just a very tiny use just to give right. the impression that it's the colors are blending together but it's not overblown you know right. if they did a huge area of it it would be massively obvious they limited uh, it to very it's a bit carefully tasteful. right um yeah but it, again yeah. that that could have been done with the banding style that we talked about with the right. sort of uh, strips, and it might have actually looked a little better, but right. I think part of their goal with this environment in particular is they wanted it to feel kind of rough. Exactly. And, uh, they were going for a grungy and, look, and keep right. in mind, this was designed on and for CRT monitors. Exactly. So, or TVs, which are even blurrier. And so it looks rougher. So they were going for that little bit of graininess, which is why they didn't use the pure straight line uh, technique mm -hmm. we're talking about for really smooth uh, 
smooth uh, gradations or smooth metal surfaces, but at the same time, it looks worse here than it would have. It would have been the perfect balance of having a little bit of gritty texture while still being a mostly smooth metal. So exactly. uh, keep that in well. mind if, you're, if you want to go for the aesthetic that they achieved back then, and you know your stuff is going to be displayed on modern monitors, then you're going to want to either use a little more color if you don't have to follow the super strict rules of a given system like you. Like if you don't want to perfectly emulate an 8-bit Nintendo, if you're just going for that aesthetic, then you can cheat and use a few extra colors that are a little closer together so that you can have the dithering without the, t the texture being too obvious or just decide to use your dithering different and not as frequently because you could get away with a lot more and it looked very different and a lot smoother back in the day on those blurry monitors. So that's about it for, uh, from the sort of technical and technique side of things. But I did want to, I actually was planning to make this sort of a disclaimer at the beginning of the video. I hope no one, especially younger people that like the general aesthetic of pixel art, don't take offense. We might sound like some old fogies that are like, oh, in my day there were these limitations and you have to follow them. The point is, if you're really trying to match that aesthetic, knowing what those limitations are and working within them will ensure not only that you will get that authentic look with the least hassle possible and the least need to keep iterating and ask yourself, why am I not achieving the look that these original games had? But also to, to be able to have those bragging rights to say, look what I did. Like I used the 8-bit Nintendo limitations. This is, it's just, it's not only bragging rights, but it's easy communication. People know how to better judge your mock-up or your art where you can say, I did this mock-up of an 8-bit Nintendo game. And if, if people, if you say that, they'll, they'll know very quickly that, or at least the more advanced or knowledgeable other artists or uh, sort of retro game aficionados, they'll know right away if you're following the graphical limitation rules or not. So just knowing things and why and when you're breaking the rules allows you to break the rules on purpose and for very specific effect. It's the same thing with fine art and figure drawing. If you know proper anatomy, proper proportions, proper skeletal structure and musculature, whenever you do something that's not normal, you're doing it on purpose for the specific intent of expressing or exaggerating the very things you want to. If you don't know all of those things, there's going to be a lot of trying and failing and, and wanting to achieve something and not knowing why you can't. And just, you know, it's something I, I see all the time with... Uh, so, so think of it that way. When people that grew up with those limitations and learning about them and grew up playing those games, it's like a, a recent aspiring pixel artist did a very nice piece of art that had the pixel art aesthetic, but and, and they, they were looking for constructive criticism. So they knew there was room for improvement and they knew there was potentially something wrong. And the thing is, like so many, uh, they were using some kind of program like, like Photoshop. So where there, there were hundreds of colors in this image that could have easily been done and look uh, potentially better and more authentically pixel art in 16 or 32 colors. And so the thing that was really off-putting about the image was that there were all of these very subtle color differences, all of these colors that were almost identical, not right near each other, and clearly no color limits. So like there was, like I said, hundreds of colors for no good reason all over the place that were just tiny, tiny variations of each other. Yet then in the mountains in the background, there was a very blatant dither, not too dissimilar, not as patterned, but not too dissimilar from this, from the very harsh dither of this original screenshot. So I made the point to this artist that overall the image is really good, but they've got this contradiction happening in the art where he added the dither for the art style. He did the art with a bunch of color and it looked nice, but it didn't look like pixel art. And right. so he wanted to add an element of the pixel art aesthetic but he didn't really think about or understand what dithering is, why it exists as part of pixel art, and when you're going to use it. And obviously there's a big 
contradiction there if you have all the colors in the world to use to make smooth blends and then you create this really harsh dithering for for instead of a smooth blend in a background element which should be even more blurred out and low contrast and smooth then it, that decision just makes no sense whatsoever so right. again like making understanding why you're making decisions and understand why the artists before you made those decisions and why they had to make those decisions it will just help you arrive at more pleasing and uh, authentic things in any art form that has intrinsic limitations yeah and that's something uh that i can mention too i mean uh, a lot of art and getting better at you know developing your skills and everything is practice Right. But you ha also have to sometimes take a step back from that. Instead of constantly toiling away trying to make something work, right. sometimes you have to take a step back and do some research and exactly. look some things up and you know intelligently learn the, the actual uh, reasons behind these things. Right. Because once you know that, that, that knowledge can change a lot for you uh, very quickly and so, save so you, a lot of time yes, and, and stress exactly. and you so, know frustration absolutely that's something worth remembering for anyone uh, that you know nothing wrong with practicing your skills but remember intelligent research goes a long way as well right. and can uh, make you a much better art artist absolutely much faster if you really dig in so and that is actually a, uh, just a really dangerous aspect to an otherwise helpful bit of advice that you hear all the time kind of a cliched expression if you want to get better at art draw 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 right right that's yeah. half true but the problem exactly. is if you keep drawing the same thing that you're already comfortable drawing in the style that you know not only are you not getting better anywhere near as fast as if you challenged yourself and studied and exposed yourself to try drawing other things in other styles, tried specifically to, to, if you thought to yourself, you know, I draw this every time and I am not really positive how the actual anatomy works behind this thing, that would be something to study and take, take the time to learn and make yourself a more powerful and flexible artist. Whereas if you just draw, 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 and you're always drawing the same things or copying the same artist you like, inevitably what's going to happen is you're actually making yourself a worse artist in a way. Because any bad habit you or that artist that you love that you copy, you're ingraining, you're hardwiring bad habits into yourself, which can become incredibly hard to break. And yes. Yeah, so that, that's a, that's another important thing to keep in mind. And if you are copying another artist, I guarantee you, whatever little mistakes they're making are going to be even worse in your copy. You know, like you'll get sometimes these generations of a copy of a copy of a copy. So the mm -hmm. first artist might know how they are abstracting something. Like they might understand the underlying anatomy or how something works that makes it that shape but they'll stylize it on purpose. They'll simplify right. it, stylize it. But then the next artist that comes along that loves their stuff, they're only basing their stuff on that already simplified and stylized thing. So all of the things in that are original artist's head that allowed them to abstract and simplify, that's not there anymore. So now the new artist, they are doing in a further degraded version without that foundation that keeps those shapes exactly the way they need to be without letting him abstract too much if you you know it's just like a, that game that they that they play in like a campfire circle of kids where you whisper something into one kid's ear and then he whispers right. and by the time you're done it's something totally different and usually yeah. nonsensical it's art the same thing can happen if you if you learn all of your art only by copying some artist that you like, right. especially if his stuff is already very stylized, you're going to end up with just a classic word is derivative, but it's, it's going to be, in a sense, degenerated. It's losing the underlying knowledge that allowed the original artist to make those abstractions in the first place effectively. Yeah, and to add to that, not to say something too obvious, but just... You know, don't always think that your inspiration has to come from other art either. Right, uh, you know, it can come from all sorts of things, photography. Right. Uh, you know, there there are loads of ways to get inspiration that 
you know, even just reading about something sometimes, right. you know, um, uh, because, uh, you know, as creative people, we're going to imagine an image in our head possibly even more clearly than someone who isn't, you know, right. so like there, there are loads of ways to gather inspiration. So remember that. Absolutely. And it's always good to uh, expose yourself to lots of different styles, artists, and especially those things. Every once in a while, if you're really training to become a better artist, whether it's pixel artist or actual illustration in high res or on traditional materials like a good old bristol board and, and uh, pencil and pen and ink and stuff like that it's always a good idea to ex expose yourself force yourself to draw things and to understand things that you don't necessarily have an interest but you know you're going to have to draw whether it be you know the the most common things are architecture and uh often either the same or the opposite gender so right. these so many young guys grow up drawing only muscle men superheroes and have a really hard to trying uh, drawing women or vice versa for uh, female artists or it depends on the person so a lot of guys growing up now they might grow up doing hyper sexy manga female characters and never draw men and then, but then they would have the same issue where they were less interested in drawing male characters and then they're going to have a lot of trouble because even though the underlying anatomical structure is so similar the proportions and the uh, superficial representation of that anatomy is so incredibly different that you know if, if you don't make sure that you understand those things that you're not so excited about then that's really going to hinder your growth as an artist yeah, and that can even go into areas of like learning about fashion and things like that. I mean, look look at how, you know, the yeah. sensibilities of of our guy here in Altered Beast. I mean, right. he's got his uh, <laughs> his underwear on, right. and uh, they were clearly thinking of a of, of a great outfit for him. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, but seriously, you, you know, you, you never know. Like when when you just seeing uh, the right photo of someone in a particular kind of dress or with a certain hairstyle. Right. Hairstyles are a big thing too. You know that we don't think about too often right. uh, with drawing characters. So it, it and that's another aspect of the world that is going to inspire your art that isn't nece it, it can be considered art, you know, fashion is, but you yeah. know that is outside the realm of creating visual art. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, that you can learn. So, yeah. I mean, and, and it's, that, that's not to say you should, uh, you know, be subscribed to, you know, Cosmopolitan or something, you know, and like constantly taking that stuff in, but you understand what I'm saying. Look right. outside of your comfort zone sometimes. Exactly. And, uh, right. and take those things in. So, yeah. So I just decided <laughs> he needed some like Calvin Klein designer briefs. So, right. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's very true. Uh, what you're saying and just about, uh, fashion is another great one. I mean, it is always, you, you are always safe if you're doing like American comic books. You can always come up with some crazy spandex, which is, which is sure, basically yeah. just like a, uh, neutered, uh, naked guy with, you know, colors and lines. You know, you need boots, you just draw a separately, separation line and you make this one color and the legs a different color. Um, but you're obviously going to be very limited. And uh, I had the same habit. Like, I, I really love, the timeless clothes, you know, like jeans and a t-shirt, stuff like that, right. that uh, are very easy to draw and you don't need to know a lot about fashion and it works. But what if you suddenly need to draw a guy in a suit and have him not look like he's found his granddad's suit from the Salvation Army or something uh, right. and you need it to be modern and, and fashionable and, and look expensive or something. I mean, obviously... It's, we live in a great age of the internet where reference is, you know, a few clicks on the keyboard away, but it definitely, you become more powerful as an artist the more you have a vocabulary, a sort of arsenal of visual information in your head to draw from. And in fact, it is worthwhile pointing out that th there's no such thing as a magical creativity. Creativity right. is the ability to combine two or more things that are otherwise not it's the the i think the the key word is juxtaposition so right. creativity creative um work that everyone has ever done has been taking things that they know and ex or experienced and combining them together in a new way 
uh, mm -hmm. or and very often the things we consider the most creative is when you take seemingly completely unrelated things and manage to work them together into some thing. And uh, so the more of these things that you have at your disposal, not only can you draw them, but it's going to increase your very ability to be creative. Obviously, if you've been exposed to one or two different actual robots and then Western like knight armor, like plate armor, and then samurai armor, those different aesthetics that are all related, you'll be able to mix and match them in so many ways and invent because you'll understand how the plates and the hinging and stuff like that, the joints has to work, the sort of layering you'll be able to do an amazing amount of creative stuff based on that foundation of knowledge, of exposure to these different aesthetic styles and just sort of this understanding of the mechanics of it as well in that example. Yeah, and and a, and a good example of that, which is pretty common knowledge, is something like Darth Vader's helmet. You know, right. like it was inspired, you know, the shape of it with the, the right. sides was inspired by sort of like samurai helmets, right. you know. So, and that's something when I realized that after probably many years of being right. a fan of, of that sort of stuff, you know, I was like, wow, I'd never really thought about that. Right. I had seen Samurais, you know, or Samurai rather. Right. Uh, and like, I never thought of it. It just clicked in me when, when I learned that. And I was like, right. wow. So it's, it's a good example of things you might not even realize, you right. know, uh, were, were made that way, you know, that are. Right. And that's the thing. And, yeah. You know? He, yeah. He, he juxtaposed some clashing things, right? right? So samurai armor in general is very brightly colored. Right. So right. and they would often have the uh, very scary mask they would wear so you couldn't see if they were fatigued or frightened themselves. There'd be mm -hmm. this ferocious looking face that was brightly colored with a crazy mustache built into it and then there would be the helmet and all these colors and like floral often floral patterned brightly colored silk pants and all this other stuff. And so that's probably why it didn't dawn on you. If Darth Vader was colored like a samurai, the shape of the helmet would have jumped out as you as also having been influenced by samurai. But he went the opposite way. So you take the very Western representation of from like the, you know, uh, ancient text and the, uh, the cowboy movies, the bad guys always wore black. Right. Exactly. So you have this, you know, this pure blackness of color, you know, use of color and there's, there's almost no contrast aside from the, you know, air conditioning box he had on his chest. But you juxtapose those two extremely different aesthetics. You would mm -hmm. never see all pure black samurai armor. And you've never seen a Western design for a helmet or especially not some futuristic thing with that such a uh, sort of samurai-esque flair to the shape of the, the helmet. And it, that made it effective. And it, and it immediately was its own new thing that just exactly. inspired so many future visual designers and things like that. And But that's the point is, like I had mentioned before, it's all about being exposed to these different things and then just these eureka moments where you go, oh, it'd be kind of cool. And that's actually a really fun creative challenge, something you could do either alone or in groups. Uh, there are a lot of really great creative games, that, especially that you could do with small groups of artists to improve your creativity and your skill. One of these games is you all write down different random things. Like you could, you know, one little slip of paper, you could write down the word swordfish or something like that. And then other people would write other things, and it could be whatever. It could be robot, kitten, pillow, whatever. And then so the goal is you got to randomly select these things, and you have to create something that combines in some way those things. And th that really forces you to use that sort of creative uh, potential in your mind to, to get used to this juxtaposition, which is the key to, uh, to creativity, which is true in not only visual arts, but storytelling and just about any other thing. I mean, even uh, culinary arts, it's all about contrasting things. And a, uh, a surprising award-winning dish is because they managed to figure out some new way to combine different flavors and textures and even temperature in the case of a culinary thing. Anyway, yeah. that's a big digression from uh, what is pixel art, but um, I think we covered most of it that we wanted to for this first video. Eventually, I hope to be able to make a really 
clean, concise, like 10 minute video that covers all the really key aspects that we're talking about. But uh, we wanted to get this ball rolling and start this conversation. So any uh, pixel artists or aspiring pixel artists out there or anyone with just an, we'd love to hear it and we'll probably do follow up videos or at least we'll take all of that feedback and, uh, and ideas into consideration when we make the final edited concise final video that just covers this whole topic in a much more ordered manner without all the digressions and stuff. Agreed. So that's, uh, that'll be it for this video. I hope it was interesting for everyone. Oh, I actually, I should also mention, uh, if you are an aspiring pixel artist and you do want to get into learning how to mimic very specific styles of pixel art from specific consoles or even old computers, then uh, keep an eye on and please subscribe to our channel and our playlist called Forensic Pixology, which I think I will add this video to once it's uploaded, because we cover not only specific games, but inevitably, even when it's for specific games, we end up talking about the technical limitations of the platform or console that that game was made for. Uh, any other final thoughts, Corey? Uh, no, I think that about sums it up. All right. So thanks, everyone, for watching, and uh, stay tuned for our next video.